I thought when, what I would talk about tonight is the regional question of the Middle East. The, the Middle East seems to always be at the center in recent years uh, of the threats to peace that exist on a global level, whether that's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, which is getting worse and worse, whether it's the U.S. occupation and war in Iraq, which is getting worse and worse, whether it's the lies that we are being told about what U.S. policy in the Middle East is all about. All of those things represent extraordinary threats to peace. I think that what, when we look at what the press is telling us right now, we're hearing that democracy is on the rise, right? Iraqis have had elections. Iraqis now maybe have a constitution. I, I, didn't, I haven't heard any news for the last eight, six or eight hours, so I don't know the latest, but the last I heard, both the Iraqi Election Commission itself and the United Nations electoral monitors were all saying it looks like fraud. Um, that may or may not pan out. They said it's going to take some days to do the kinds of recounts necessary to see. But it's significant. What they found was that in two provinces, 95% uh, of the voters voted yes. In one province, 95% of, the, of those voting voted no. And in four provinces, 95% of, of uh, qualified voters voted. And all of those numbers don't match what the numbers usually are in internationally recognized um, traditional, typical voting patterns, especially for a country at war. So there's a great deal of concern about what this referendum was really all about. And I think that's something that we do have to take very seriously. But I also think it's important that we recognize what this process of constitution drafting and constitutional ratification and all of that represents, whether or not it turns out that the vote itself was fraudulent. It may turn out not to have been. It's certainly possible. I mean, right now, I think almost anything is possible in Iraq in terms of these kinds of issues of who, which communities would come out to vote, which ones would not. But I think there's some very serious problems about the Iraqi constitution that it's important for us to understand because we're being sold a bill of goods. We're being told that this constitution is evidence that, one, Iraq is a sovereign nation, two, that it's moving towards democracy, three, that this is an Iraqi initiative, four, that it's been urgent and Iraqis are demanding that it happen fast and that's why we had to have the vote right now. And what a surprise, not one of those things is actually very true. So we have some serious problems with this constitution. Some of it has been talked about a lot. We've heard a lot about some of the very good language that indeed is present in this constitutional draft. Language that talks explicitly about uh, defending a, a wide range of individual human rights. The right of free speech, the right to a trial, the right to ha being proved guilty beyond a reasonable doubt before you can be held in prison, uh, the right to a lawyer. Uh, there's a whole host of those kinds of individual freedoms. It says that men and women are, are created equal and will have equal rights in the society and that 25% of the seats in the, in the future parliament will be reserved for women. These are all very good you know, kinds of things that we would all like to see in constitutions. We'd also like to see some of them implemented in our constitution, but that's a different matter. But, but what's, I think, not being talked about is a couple of things. One is, we're sort of being told, they, they don't quite say it like this, but they sure imply it, that for the first time, Iraqis have a constitution. Isn't that fabulous? Well, sorry folks, but Iraq had, in fact, a very good constitution under a very bad regime, which ignored many of the tenets of that constitution, as so many regimes around the world do. We won't talk about where, but nonetheless, many regimes ignore their own constitutions. And Iraq was no different. The language of the old Iraqi constitution wasn't half bad. It really wasn't half bad. It had some of the most advanced language in the Middle East of any constitution around women's rights, for instance. So this is not something particularly new and different from Iraqi, for Iraqis. But we're not hearing about it. We are hearing about some things. We're hearing a lot about the question of federalism. And that is indeed a, a very central question here because what we're really talking about is not the idea of should there be 
provinces in Iraq and should there be provincial governments. Nobody is questioning that there will be provinces and there should be provincial governments. The question is, is federalism a nation, a unified country that has some cantons or provinces or states or whatever they're called within it who, who have responsibility for certain things, whether it's roads or health care or whatever? Or are we talking about semi-independent, uh, what, what we might call a real extremist version of federalism. And that's what's being proposed in the Iraqi Constitution. And it will be institutionalized by the language that says that any power that is not explicitly granted to the central government devolves automatically to the regional or state or provincial government. So the main power is the province. And whatever they decide can be deliberately assigned to the central government is fine. The only two things they mention are, are foreign policy and defense of the borders. Everything else, including the economy, all individual rights, the nature of the courts, everything else lies in the hands of the provincial government. So what does that mean? It means, among other things, that all these great women's rights that we're hearing about can be overturned in a minute. So that if you have, for example, a woman in Northern, well, let's use an example in southern Iraq, in the Shia-dominated areas, where they're talking about setting up a super, um, like a super region made up of three separate, I mean, nine separate provinces, that in those Shia-dominated areas, they may create a Sharia court, meaning a religious court, an Islamic religious court. Now, according to the Constitution, women are created equal. Women have the same rights as men to, for example, initiate divorce. Uh, call for, for claiming child custody, any of those things. But if that woman happens to live in one of those nine provinces in the South, she may not have the option because the power will lie with the provincial government, not with the federal government, to overturn the Constitution, to write laws that directly contradict the Constitution, to create a court system that completely opposes a secular court system. So this is what we're actually facing with this draft that gives the reason of why so many people in Iraq have every reason to oppose it. It's not only people who are the supporters of the Ba'ath Party or who want to see Saddam Hussein not go on trial or something who are against this constitution. There's all kinds of reasons to be opposed to it. And that's the part that we are hearing about, the, the federalism issue. One of the parts we're not hearing at all is the whole question of control of the wealth of Iraq, the oil money. And this is one that, that could be really nightmarish in the future in terms of setting the stage for the real division of the country. Because what the, what the Constitution says is that all Iraqi oil fields currently under um, production, the money from that belongs to the central government and is to be divided among the Iraqi people on a national equal basis. It sounds exactly what it should be, right? Under the control of the central government, everybody gets a fair share of the wealth. That sounds right. The problem is, it's only that part of Iraq's known oil reserves currently under production. That's less than one-third of Iraq's known reserves. It's going to run out pretty quick. As soon as they start to expand to new oil fields that are not yet under production, that they know are there, they've done the exploration work, but they're not under production yet, that oil will not belong to the central government and will not, there will be no obligation on anybody to distribute it fairly across the whole country. That will be under the control of the region or province where the oil exists. That means in the north of Iraq, in the Kurdish zones, the northern oil fields are very rich oil fields. The Kurds are going to be very rich because they will control the oil. In the south, they're going to be even richer because Iraq's biggest and, and richest oil fields are in the, north, in the southern provinces, in the Shia-dominated areas that will likely become this super region of nine separate southern provinces.